uh, Taoiseach, ambassadors, uh, members of the Oireachtas, and guests and friends. Uh, my name is Kingsley Aitens of Diaspora Matters, and I want to first of all thank all of you for coming. You're busy people, with a lot on your plate, and yet you have shown that you want to give time, you want to give attention to something which has been a real passion of mine for many, many years, which is the diaspora. And I used to work for CTT, if you're old enough, if you remember Cora Strachtola. I used to work for uh, IDA, I worked for the Ireland Funds for 20 odd years, and many of my pals from that are here. Uh, and diaspora is not a particularly pretty word. And I think until a few years ago, most people in Ireland thought it was something you took two of with a headache or some form of socially transmitted disease, but things have changed. And we've come a long way since Brendan Behan went to Toronto and he met a group of very successful members of the Irish diaspora and he said, I'll go back now to Dublin and tell them, you are shooting up the social ladder, you are all making pots of money, you are living in huge houses, and that will put them all in a right lousy form for Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've, uh, we've moved on. And I was lucky enough to work, and privileged enough to work with the Ireland Funds for over 20 years, but when I started there, I met the wonderful Dan Rooney, whom you all know is the ambassador here. Dan has a colorful brother called Pat Rooney, who took me aside in Palm Beach early in my stay, and he said, where were you born? I said, Ireland. He said, where were you educated? And I said, Ireland. And he said, we've well, got to remember something. You're an FBI. And I said, Pat, what's an FBI? I said, you're a foreign-born Irishman. Real Irishmen are born in the Bronx, they're born in South Boston, they're born in Chicago. And I learned something that day. I learned something very, very, very true, which is there is no such, uh, there is no such thing as an Irish diaspora in any way. There are hundreds of Irish diasporas. And you have to deal with them and treat them quite separately and have different strategies for them. When I lived in, um, in Sydney, Australia with my pal that I'm involved with Networking Matters, Ed Kelly, we formed a business organization called the Landstand Club. And it's still there today, there's some 2,000 members. But some Irish there were very visible, some were very quiet. And Ed and I used to call them DCPs. A DCP is a deep closet paddy. If you look <laughs> deep enough, you can find these people uh, and they're remarkable and they do great things. The diaspora is enormous. There are 215 million people in the world who now live in a country other than the one they were born in. That number has tripled over the last 40 years. There are 80 million Europeans who live in a country other than the one they were born in. 3% of the world's population, 1 in 10 in the developed world. Migration is a phenomenon of our time. I did this project as I did the previous two, the report for Farmley and the Philanthropy Toolkit with my great pal, uh, Nicola White. Nicola, put your hand up because she's a, an Irish barrister, lawyer, and mediation specialist. And this toolkit was a really a way of looking at what was going on around the world. And we started with a big question. We said, what made China the world's greatest manufacturing country? What made India a technology hub? What made Israel the home of innovation, the second largest VC company country in the world? And what helped bring peace to Northern Ireland? And the answer to each one was networking with their diasporas in the United States particularly, but all around the world. And that's a really powerful thing. And I'm the founder member of a group called CASE. CASE stands for Copy and Steal Everything. And I go around the world <laughs> figuring out who does this stuff really, really well. And this toolkit was an, an opportunity to collate in one place and present to the Hillary Clinton Global Diaspora Forum the findings, which we did some months ago. And I know the situation in Ireland is at one level is quite desperate. We have this incredible financial problem. There's an old American expression that says, what the fat boy does in the canoe affects everybody. And so you got the sense that... <laughs> just, when this boy decides to get up and move around, it kind of burgers up everything for everybody. But, uh, but we believe that networking with the Irish diaspora is a key piece of Ireland's economic recovery. We also believe Ireland could be the best country in the world in this space. We're not quite there yet, but we could be. And the reason we could be is because there is innovation and creativity happening in this space in Ireland. Let me just give you a few examples. John McCulligan is here, the man who created Riverdance that has been seen by 21 million people around the world and has quietly launched and will launch at the Global Diaspora Forum now in Dublin Castle, his World Irish Social uh, website, which is an extraordinary piece of work that came out of Farmley One and came out of uh, bringing together a team of really talented people. That's interesting. Don Leary Harbour are going to build a 50 million euro diaspora.
Knaresborough Museum on the Carlisle Pier, the pier from which so many people emigrated from this country, first in the UK and then further afield. Mike Ferrick from Loch Grey is here. One interesting project he has where he actually took a reverse approach to the emigration and migration. He discovered the people in Loch Grey, where their forebears had left and gone. Tracked them, tracked their descendants and invited them back and 50 of them came back this summer to Loch Grey. So this fascinating creativity. Fault Ireland now with their champions, corporate champions program, enticing people and people in this room to uh, run conferences and have major events in Ireland. Later this year, I just saw Tony Burke, who's a partner in Mason Hayes, current one of our sponsors here tonight. Um, later this year, the ABA, the American Bar Association, had an annual conference in Ireland. 1,400 partners of US law companies are gonna be here in Ireland, and it's headed up by Tony Burke here in Ireland. But in the United States, it's headed up by Michael Burke, whose grandparents come from Roscommon and Tipperary. They're no relation with the same tribe. And there's a wonderful example of using those connections to have a great event here in Ireland. So I think that that's really quite exciting what's happening here. I want to thank the people who supported me tonight. You see their names up here, Key Capital, and uh, Ward Gosh, John Mullins has been a great supporter of this whole initiative going back for some time. PwC have been supporters. Um, Ian Highland, one of the great networks from Ireland, who's developing networks in the United States and developing networks in, in uh, Asia Pacific as well. So I want to thank all of you, but I particularly want to thank you, Tisha. We've had conversations about this topic, and you've shown an interest in it. You've picked up the ball and run with it from Farmley One. 120 people came to Farmley One, and now the government are going to run the next Dublin Castle, which is a huge number of more people coming. So it's proven the case. Philanthropy uh, has proven it as well. Over the Ireland funds have written checks and Hugo McNeil is here tonight, Basil Gaber from the UK, Katrina and Nikki and Caitlin from the office here. The Ireland funds have written checks for a quarter of a billion dollars in Ireland over the last 20 years that hasn't got the government or the taxpayer a cent. And so it proves that it can be done. So uh, Thisha, I thank you for the courtesy of coming here tonight. Um, I want you to draw a vision for where this whole space can go. Because the exciting thing about this is that every company, every organization, every city, every town, every individual, and particularly everybody in this room, can work and have a diaspora initiative and work to make this thing happen. <coughs> so Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. He didn't say, I have a strategic plan. But I think in this space, we can certainly have both. So I ask you to please welcome and thank Anthisha for coming here this evening. Before another, the, the Queen of England has made Irish the sexiest language in the world. I should say, <laughs> first of all, I want to say that what I'm going to say does not do justice to this book. This is quite an incredible document. I've been through it once or twice. It's a great read. You did a wonderful job. And I want you all to understand that from my, from my perspective, each one of you here actually carries a piece of the jigsaw of the picture of Ireland now and for the future. And this is something that's really close to my heart, I have to say, because diaspora is actually what makes us who we are and what we are. And for me, that comes from the, the DNA that we have inherited because the requirements of Irish people for two and a half centuries was to leave. And when you face new challenges, new peoples, and new places, uh, we prove that the fact that we're curious and inquisitive and gregarious and creative has made a massive impact that is completely disproportionate to the size of our country and our population in places around the world, be it in social policy, in economics, in politics, or in business. I actually believe genuinely that we have within us, if we can just turn it on, a flare, a global flare, that people around the world will say, that's the place to be. They are the people to be with. Because there is that enigmatic charisma about Irish people that others want to be with us. I remember Eddie Jordan, when I uh, was in the Department of Tourism, we gave him some sponsorship for the, the Jordan cars. 
sponsorship consisted of having uh, Shamrock on the front of the uh, Jordan and on the the neck of the uh, of the driver. Problem was, you couldn't see either at the speed they were going at. <laughs> but Eddie did say to me that, irrespective of where the um, where the Formula One races were taking place, when they were over, it was the Irish pit that everybody wanted to be with. And that's a human characteristic that you kind of buy. It's there. They want to associate with us and be with us. And I want to pay tribute to you, Kingsley, because this is quite an incredible book, and there's one here for each one of you. And if you read it and don't feel somehow inspired or encouraged or enthusiastic, then you're not reading it correctly. Because this is about you. It's about your families, it's about your connections, it's about us as a country and us as a people. And actually, I genuinely believe this. This is one of the most important kind of meetings that we can have. Because you are all ambassadors. You are all part of the network that is so significant for this country, north and south and what we have to do. And it's been proven through the peace process and the difficulties that we've had over the years in that. And during his time with the Ireland Funds, the organization be became a, a world leader in the area of uh, philanthropy and the diaspora development. Go back to Tony O'Reilly and Dan Rooney when they started off this <coughs> beginning. Look at Loretta Brennan Glucksman now with the um, Promising Ireland and the the capacity to raise another 100 million by the end of, 20, by, by, uh, end of 2013. These are, these are enormous opportunities. I think that uh, Kingsley is the kind of person who understands actually what Muincher means, which is about yourselves. He knows that um, the great scattering that is around the world actually has the capacity to be drawn together in an irresistible force uh, for good. Uh, and for connection that will that will rise our country that will make everybody associated with us understand that we mean business and getting back to the heights of that ladder so I will say to you which uh, means as you know uh, thank you very much indeed I want to say that government are taking um, a very broad and inclusive um, view of uh, the global community for those of you who can remember your history in the in the in the dark ages of your mind, you will recall, if you can, the monks and the missionaries and the educators who left this island, who brought the light to Europe and Central Europe um, many centuries ago, and for those who who left with missionary zeal to convert China or to convert Asia or Africa, these things in their own way now pay huge dividends in the sense of an understanding of where Ireland is, of who the Irish are, and the, the quality and the impact that our people have made in terms of, um, of education uh, and, the, and the business of, of lifting people's spirits and making them understand that they really have a contribution to make uh, to humanity. So whether we, whether we gather with a national flag or the nation's heart, Government last week, with the, when the Thonish was in uh, New York, he launched the Certificate of Irish Heritage. And the first of those went to uh, Joseph Hunter, mm -hmm. a New York fireman, and he was last seen striding towards the South Tower of the World uh, Trade Centre with Squadron 288 from Queens. He's finally become the recipient of the first um, Certificate of Irish Heritage. So we know that there are, there are approximately one million who were born on the island of Ireland living abroad. It's a remarkable figure for a small population. The diaspora works out at 70 million, 70 million people, 70 million men and women. Our diaspora, our people. This represents a brilliant opportunity. <coughs> because there's something deep inside us all that cries out to connect, to want to connect the need to connect. And that goes back to what I said about the emigrant experience. I was in Cleveland uh, a number of years ago at one of the association functions, and the following morning, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the organizers said to me, let me show you something. And it brought me down by the, uh, by the Cuyahoga River and traced back the, the impact of the Irish from that river um, uh, landwards. <coughs> 
And he based it on the, um, on the size of the churches. A very small one when they landed after the 1840s, a mile back and further mile back, and eventually arrived at the cathedral, which in its own way showed the demonstration of the impact of the Irish contribution in that part of America, and the same was replicated in so many others. So out of, out of all of that comes the, an experience that we are now living again uh, due to circumstances that government are now trying to change. Many of our people live abroad. But the, the historical loss of generations, if you like, the, the dispossessed, uh, out of all of that has emerged a modern Irish global family. Well, last week, the, um, the Minister of Finance was in Washington, the Minister for Foreign Affairs was in New York, the Minister for Enterprise was down through the Carolinas and Eastern America, the Minister of State and Education was in Singapore, and the Chairman of the Foreign Affairs um, Committee was in Vietnam dealing with uh, issues about adoption and the, the difficulties there. In every one of those cases, they came back and reported to government about the the changed perception of our country and our people, changed in, in reputation of the uh, economy and the way it's heading, of our, of, our, um, of our perception abroad as a country and as a people. And when you get that internationally, all you've got to do is make that, make that be realizable at home as well, uh, that we are now headed as a people and as a country in the direction of where we're going to sort this out, uh, and everybody's got their contribution to make. So when you speak about the diaspora and all of that, it is about a sense of being, of being claimed by and claiming the country of one's heart, if you like. And what is all of that? It's the, it's the line from the poem. It's the, it's the fragment of the, the grey sky. It's a piece of, of stone you pick up on Dunengus. To, it's the purity of the voices of many of our singers. These are the things that make us up in a way that very few people can match. I think the, uh, the fact that we have learned so much and have put together in all its diverse forms a peace process which has sent out a message as an example and as a model around the world speaks for itself. The, uh, the fact that we are focused on the issue of immigrants and the fact that we're now in a position to tie all of this together with technology that we never had before means that we actually have at our disposal a unique opportunity to make the new brand for Ireland um, as, a, as, a, as an incredible um, priceless uh, characteristic. I see Big Jim here, he'll give us a rundown on New Zealand before too long. But I, like millions of others, watched, watched the performance from New Zealand. And I really would, you know, do your, do your Irish heart very proud to see that. And I saw that spirit in Croke Park, in the hurling final and the football final, where here at home, people rose to the challenge of what it is to be competitive in an Irish sense. So whether it be in business or politics, or music, or literature, or wherever. We as a people should never be ashamed to hold our chins up and our heads high. Because when we get this right, we're going to be the best ever. I see my friend from Galway here, Alan, who travels the world incessantly on behalf of Ireland, an Irish business. There are so many people here who have a real contribution to make. But I think that you should read this toolkit. And as I said, genuinely, if you read it, and you don't feel invigorated or enthusiastic or confident about us as a people and as a country, read it again. It's quite a brilliant book, quite a brilliant book. And I hope that in 10 days time, when the 300 or more uh, arrive in Dublin for their contribution to the World Forum, we appreciate what the last government did in the sense of calling that together. And we learn that on this occasion, will be a, a serious follow through with that these people are coming here because they want to be challenged to make their contribution for our country. And that's our charge, if you like. And I suppose when you look down from the, not from the exalted seat of government, but look down at what it is that we have to do, you can understand that probably the sort of biggest challenges that we've got in the management of our time 
and the efficiency by which we can make decisions and drive them through. So other countries around the world would love to have an opportunity like this, with a toolkit like this at their disposal, to harness their peoples in their, in wherever they are. So for me, to get a text from Sakhalin Island or from Ghana, or from South America or wherever, or the chief executive of a major um, um, American multinational who walked into me last week and said, when we were talking about the business, he said, sure, I know, I was at, I wasn't at school with your cousin. <laughs> How was that? And the fact of the matter was that my, to my um, grand uncles left for America in the late 1890s. One went to Butte, Montana, worked in the copper mines, had ten children. They scattered all, all over that part of America, and one of their children is the person that he was referring to. And it was like as if he never left. So the contact and the connection made by our Irish people is quite unique. And that was epitomized for me this morning, talking to the chief executive. Of a, of a, a, a multinational business. He walked into my office and said, you know, after some discussion, one of the things that we did was that we shifted the jewel in our crown from Silicon Valley to Sandyford. And the reason we did that was because of the absolute talent and creativity and ingenuity of the people that you've got here. So the challenge for us is to challenge ourselves and not to be either lazy are run down about what it is that we can do and what it is that we will do. And for my part, this represents an unprecedented opportunity to get this right. We have a glorious, a glorious toolkit at our, at our disposal here. Please God, when our World Forum get together and we harness those talents, they're going to make an immeasurable, an immeasurable impact for good for Ireland. I'd like, to, I'd like to say to you that I, I can't really express in sort of a speech what this actually means. But if everybody here takes a little bit of your toolkit with them and that they apply it in their business, in their individual walks of life, in their connections with other people abroad, it adds to that process of understanding that it is all about connectedness. It is all about making those connections. It is all about not being afraid to discourse with people about the talent and opportunity that we have here. Um, and as I said to so many people, you can have all the technology you like. You can't look somebody in the eye and say, I can do business with you. That's the glorious opportunity for Ireland to build on our technology, to build on the technical capacity, to tie our entire diaspora together. And use all your quotations and say, we are of Ireland. We are Ireland. Our people are Ireland, uh, and for that, we should use these opportunities in a way that's never been done before. So thank you for your attendance. Um, thank you for your contribution. I know that many of you have, have done much more than I in respect of our country, and will for the future. And I just want to say to you that on behalf of the government, we appreciate you coming here, but I'd like, I'd like that you would focus and concentrate on what you can do for Ireland, with Ireland, for the times ahead. Okay, we may have 15 months of some difficulty up ahead and a challenge, but it's not the first time that Irish people have risen and met with adversity and beat it. This is an economic challenge, an economic challenge. And for our part, we'll, we'll contribute in a comprehensive fashion to the European discussion that has to be put in place to deal with the turmoil out there. But for the future, you people, working with government, have a unique and brilliant opportunity to put your piece of that jigsaw up on that picture of Ireland heading onwards and upwards in the right direction. Give us, give us three and a half, give us five years. They will all know that we've set out and accomplished what it is that we said we would do. By 2016, I want to see that we have proven beyond year and age be the best small country in the world in which to do business. Let that brand be out there. Pro-business, pro-enterprise, pro-humanity, pro-people. Because we have within ourselves a unique brand that makes a difference. As you used to say in the, in the days of tourism long ago, send them away with a unique and quality experience 
when, that were, when they were stuck in the traffic jam on Brooklyn Bridge, they said, God, wouldn't it be great to be an actor? <laughs> you all have that trick with inside you. Use it. Use it well. And when you do, even if it's only conversation, some of it might be a little bit of blather. You are making a little back to a country which was very good for us. So for me, I'm happy to leave this charge. Thank you, Kingsley. It's a brilliant document. Take it, read it, read it again. Talk about it and use it because you're fighting for your country. Thank you very much. Please stay, enjoy a drink, or join us in the bar afterwards. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.